As you know, it's Holocaust Memorial Day this week, and so there are an awful lot of these events. And what I'm going to try and do is use my book a little bit to contextualise that, because one of the arguments of my book is, in fact, um, that focusing on Auschwitz alone is not enough. So the book really is about three different things. It's about the long-term reverberations of the Holocaust among many different communities, communities of experience, those who lived through it, and not merely the victims and survivors on whom we're putting so much focus this week, but also among perpetrators, people who are complicit, people who are involved in doing it. <coughs> then among communities of connection, those who have personal connections with that past, not merely children of survivors. Again, we've heard a lot from the second generation this week and many times, but also children of perpetrators and simply second generation who wonder what their parents did, where they were in the war. Communities of identification, those who feel associated quite closely with that past, even if they have no personal links. Many younger West Germans, for example, felt deep remorse and shame, even if they were not themselves children of perpetrators. Many Israelis are taken on trips to Poland to see the death camps, even if their own grandparents were not actually survivors from Poland or elsewhere. In fact, if they've grandparents were not survivors at all that had been living in Palestine for decades before. Um, and then subsequent generations and others, all of us, what do we do with this past? Why, why is it still important to us? What can we take from it today? So those are the, the long-term issues. Then I've got a very specific part of the book, part two, which was going to be just one chapter, but it kept growing and growing. If you've seen the book out there, you'll see it's got a bit bigger than it's intended to be. <laughs> sort of turned into three books under one pair of covers. Um, part two is really about justice. Who was brought to account in court and who wasn't? And what about the justice for those victims who failed to gain recognition, failed to gain compensation, and so on? And finally, the issue of understanding how it could happen. <coughs> Obviously, chronologically, when you're writing a history book, you tend to do things in order of happening. Um, and I plonked that stuff on first, so that's part one of the book. And I did that in part because my husband kept saying to me, but nobody will know what you're talking about if you don't tell them what happened first. So I kind of assumed that people would know, and then the more I explored it, the more I thought, actually, I don't know. This is new to me, the way I'm seeing it now, and it's raising new questions to me. So those are really the three parts of the book. Um, so Auschwitz is an icon, why? Why have we got this incredible focus on Auschwitz, which was technically not liberated on the 27th of January, simply that the Red Army arrived there and found that the SS and the guards had already fled, taking with them those who were still fit enough to go on a death march. So they arrived and found 7,000 sick and dying prisoners. It, you can't really call it liberation, but we mark that day when the Red Army arrived. It was the la why do we focus on it? It was the largest single death camp. More than a million people were killed there. The other dedicated extermination camps had numbers between a quarter of a million, half a million, maybe three quarters of a million, but none of them over a million in any single one place. It had many different groups who were taken there. So not merely Jews from across Europe, but also political prisoners, Polish prisoners, Soviet prisoners of war, gypsies. So there are many different groups who might want to commemorate people who were imprisoned there. And this, I think, is very significant, had the largest single number of survivors because it ran this enormous network of subcamps right across Silesia and beyond. So those who were fortunate enough to be selected for work rather than instant gassing had a higher chance of survival. The average life expectancy of those selected for work was three months. Just three months was the average life expectancy. But those who made it through, who were lucky, who had easier work details or were fitter, stronger, younger, made it through. So it's the largest single number of survivors. You compare that to other death camps, Belgets, for example, only two people are known to have survived, and one of them was assassinated in 1946 while he was just giving evidence about what he had experienced. Shelm, though, the first to start operating, had maybe six or seven people who survived.
Sobibor and Treblinka had a few more than that, several dozen in each case, because there were prisoner uprisings, revolts and escapes. But this has the largest single number of survivors, and therefore we have an enormous number of memoirs and testimonies from Auschwitz survivors. And this has sort of made it the iconic story we imagine the Holocaust means arrival on a train, unloading, selection, showers. You know, that story is what we think of as the Holocaust survival story because of accounts in many, many different languages, French, Hungarian, Czech, German, you know, across Europe, and testimonies given by survivors to all the video collection, uh, testimony collections and so on. And, not least, it's got good transport links, Krakow, I don't know how many of you have been there, but quick, cheap flights to Krakow Airport, um, tourist tours arranging, I find this really difficult, the advertising on the tourist board saying, see the Varvel Castle, the salt mines and Auschwitz, a one day coach trip around the three highlights. Mm -hmm. So it's become this kind of tourist destination and now it has more visitors every year than it killed throughout the entire time of its operation. There are more than a million people visiting every year and they're crawling over it. You have to get a timed tour, basically, to see it. And I think that makes it really difficult. When I first went in 1988, when it was still communist Poland, it was just Auschwitz I that was visible, really signposted, because that's where the Polish political prisoners had been, and they were celebrating communist resistance and heroic Polish nationalism and all that kind of stuff. <coughs> Birkenau was totally deserted. We were the only people going to see it in 1988. It was just overgrown with weeds. Now it's just crawling. So I put the three pictures up just because they are, two of them are iconic, the Birkenau gates and the Arbeitmacht Frei sign on the main camp. But the bottom one is not part of the tourist trail, that's the Ige Farben plant, which is still a factory, still in use today, using slave labour at the time. And to me that has to stand as a symbol for all the use of slave labourers by employers across the Reich, everywhere. Um, and that's kind of downplayed in the memory that we have of Auschwitz, that implication of manufacturers, employers, industrialists in the exploitation of slave labour is kind of downplayed and lost from the memory where we think it's just the gas chambers that are truly evil. What does Auschwitz then obscure? It obscures so many things. I've just again tried to pick out two or three. The Holocaust by bullets across Eastern Europe. As many people died outside the camps as inside the camps, 2,000 miles across from the Baltics to the Black Sea, people were being pulled out of their villages, their towns, their hamlets, taken to newly built, newly dug mass graves just outside in the fields and forests nearby and shot into them. And I think that has been obscured partly because of the decades of communism. It's not memorialised, partly because the focus has been on the industrialised nature of killing, not the face-to-face -face local killings that involve neighbours, workmates, former schoolmates killing their other neighbours, workmates, former schoolmates. It's a quite different kind of Holocaust to what we think about, that Eastern European Holocaust by bullets. The ghettos and disease and starvation that people experienced in ghettos across Eastern Europe. I've got a couple of pictures on the left that really I found quite agonising. That little three-year-old boy on his trike shortly before he was taken to the Litzmannstadt ghetto, which ghetto, and then taken to Schalmö to be gassed in one of the very first stationary gassing centres using gas vans. Um, or the guy below him who was clearly starving in the ghetto, very early selected for gassing and shell no. Um, the picture in the middle, the, the coloured one, is just a mass grave in one of the forests in Eastern Europe near Riga in the Rumbula Forest. I took that in the summer when I was looking at that. The one on the right is just to indicate again the mass of camps. That's an SS camp where he's using slave labour to dig stuff. It's just trying to indicate there's this enormous range of inhumanity right across the Reich. And I think what we have to remember, and this is kind of familiar dates for you, I'm sure all of you are so familiar with Nazi history I don't need to go through it, but just remember there is this stage by stage 
Um, I often think about it in this way. In 1932, if you had spoken to somebody in Germany, they would have said the Holocaust was unthinkable, unimaginable. And yet in 1942, it was happening. So what went on in that 10 years? And what you see is this slow process of social exclusion, discrimination, oppression, changes in the way in which people relate to the Nazi regime. The book I'm writing at the moment is working on some of that stuff, so I don't want to go into detail on it, otherwise I'll risk giving you another whole lecture on that, <laughs> but I can't try and restrain myself on that. But if you get to the period of 1939 onwards, you've got the killing of the mentally and physically disabled in the so-called euthanasia programme, you've got the killing of civilians immediately after the invasion of Poland, and then that switch in the summer of 1941 to the notion not merely that you're going to kill some civilians, including women, children, the elderly, but that you're going to try and eradicate all, you're going to try and exterminate the entire Jewish race, as they called it, and then the extermination camps range of victims, which in my book I try to go much beyond the usual focus on the Holocaust as the Jewish tragedy, which it was, but I try to write the stories of gay men, for example, who after the war still found that homosexuality was criminalised, so they were too ashamed, even after it was decriminalised, they were still too ashamed to talk about the reasons why they'd been incarcerated. There's stories like that that I try to bring out in the book. But what I think is important is to understand that the machinery of persecution involves many, many, many people. In my view, millions. Um, so we're not talking about just Hitler, Himmler, Heydrich, you know, the Hitman, his evil henchman. We're not talking about just the Gestapo, even the Einsatzgruppe and the police forces, which takes it into the hundreds, several, the hundreds of thousands. Um, the decent army, the German army had this reputation of being decent, but even at the most conservative estimate, the lowest of all the estimates, 5% of soldiers in the German army were involved in killing Jewish civilians in the mass shootings on the Eastern Front. 5% amounts to three quarters of a million people. So we're talking about getting on for a million people actually involved in shootings, killings, gassings, physical violence. And beyond that, we have the professionals who are involved. I've written down a range of them there and could spin that out, but I won't. There is then the question of what were the people, what were the Germans, what was their role? I think one of the things I try and do is get away from a notion of the Germans and try and understand different patterns of behaviour. Those who were enthusiastic, those who just conformed and went along with it, and those who had an inner distance, didn't like it, but whether because they were afraid of what might happen, or whether because of peer group pressure or desire to get, they remained inactive. Um, the book I'm writing at the moment is actually about this roots to inaction, the passivity, how to explain bystanders not getting involved on behalf of victims. In Reckonings, I take some specific examples. One is what I call the Mialet's microcosm. And I'll just introduce to you very quickly a guy called Rudy Zimmermann, who was an ethnic German who grew up in that area of Poland, but spoke both Polish and German because of his ethnic German background, this little community. Um, he was a bit thick. He was not able to go to the um, secondary school that all his Jewish primary school classmates went to because he just wasn't bright enough. He was a bit jealous of them. When the Germans invade, the Gestapo come along, they need an interpreter. He speaks both Polish and German. Great, they take him on as an interpreter. Even more important, he knows who all the Jews are. So when they start rounding up and selecting to ship them off to Sobibor to gas, he's great because he can go around the market square that you see there. That's them being rounded up and taken off, one of the first deportations in the general government. Uh, he can say, in that house over there, first floor, I know there's a Jewish family living there, even if they're hiding, pretending not to be. So he's actually very useful. He then gets more and more involved and starts being someone who is used by the Gestapo actually to shoot Jews into mass graves. So he becomes a murderer from being just a rather thick young teenager. Um, his boss in the Gestapo headquarters is a guy called Walter Tormeyer, who has a Jewish mistress. This is racial defilement under Nazi uh, views 
and, but he rather likes this voluptuous woman. Um, and one day, when he is about to be found out and he thinks he'd better get rid of her, he takes her for a walk in the woods and shoots her in the back of the neck. I'll come back to that. But he's the guy who's giving Zimmerman orders. So remember Zimmerman and Tom Ryan. Uh, the Germans generally knew exactly what was going on, so this notion we never knew anything about it is rubbish. That's Kristallnacht up the top. People looking at a Jewish shop where the window panes have been smashed in, many of them going in and plundering and looting and enriching themselves. Down the bottom left in that photo, you can see at least six German soldiers with cameras taking snapshots. This is their great chance of foreign travel. You know, these are ordinary Germans from towns and villages across the Reich who've never been abroad before. Suddenly they're off in exciting places witnessing historic events. They take photographs, they send them home, they have them developed. And so that is very typical, public hanging and lots of German soldiers photographing. That one is a death march which a woman took from an upstairs window. She was quite a feisty <coughs> young woman. Um, she worked in a photography shop in Munich and so she was able to get her reels developed quite surreptitiously. She also, her father kept a beehive in the garden and she used to get the prisoners to leave letters in the beehive which she would then post to their loved ones if they left an address on it. And she left out potatoes and bits of bread for the prisoners to pick up when they were going back and forth to their work camps. But that was a death march that she photographed. Post-war, Germans say, we never knew anything about it. And that, I love that photo because it's a mother who is still trying to stop her son knowing anything about it, seeing it, witnessing it. But that claim, we never knew anything about it, that starts being the national refrain in April 45. That's when at first Germans really start saying, we didn't know. So what happens after the war? Um, varies with context. The Nuremberg trials have been big in the public imagination. But what happens is very, very quickly, amnesties and rehabilitation. In the late 1940s already, America and West Germany think Cold War takes priority, anti-communism takes priority. If you were lucky enough in the late 1940s not to have been sentenced to death and executed, but been given the life prison sentence, you were likely to be released in the early 1950s after just a few years in jail, three or four years in some cases. That was all. It's pretty shocking. From the later 1950s, Cold War becomes important again because the GDR, Communist East Germany, accuses West Germany, rightly, of having lots of former Nazis in high places in government. This is true. West Germany gets embarrassed and thinks, oh, we'd better do something about this and show we're actually dealing with this past. And then you get the big trials of the 60s and 70s, about which I could talk for the next 120 pages. <laughs> Um, but this is the statistics. More than I, I think more than three quarters of a million people involved in mass murder. 99% of people who killed Jews were never brought to trial. In West Germany, more than 140,000 were investigated. About 14,000, 10% of them were prosecuted. Fewer than 6,700 actually convicted. So we're talking about getting on for a million people and we have roughly 6,700 convicted of something, but only 164 of them were convicted of murder. This is extraordinary. You can murder six million people, but you've only got 164 people sentenced for murder. Others were convicted of much lesser crimes, and nearly 5,000 of that 6,700 were sentenced to less than two years in prison. Even people, at the, the camp guards at Belgez, where I said there were only two survivors and one was assassinated, of eight people put on trial, seven were acquitted. Because, quote, there wasn't evidence to show that they actually wanted to do what they were doing. They were only following orders. So it wasn't murder in the Western sense, the criminal law of intention to kill. It was just doing their job, shoveling tens, dozens, hundreds into the gas chambers every day until they'd killed 300,000 people, but none of them was a murderer. It, it's an <coughs> extraordinary system. So my argument about West Germany, which is a bit counter to everything that's been generally prevalent in the literature, is that it's got a great reputation for facing up to the past, but this is ill-deserved. 
It's a reputation built on public controversies, media coverage, talking about it, memorialising, remembering victims, but reintegrating, rehabilitating former Nazis, not bringing them to justice in the courts. And you can see lots of different ways in which justice failed in West Germany. Key professional groups never brought into court. The re nazification of the legal profession, former Nazi judges had been sentencing people for political offences to death in the Nazi courts, were judges in post-war West Germany saying, oh, my mate, I can remember you know, the good old days together and I understand why he might have done that and, being, and so on. Political choices, the use of criminal law. Um, this all changes after the Demianyuk trial in 2011, but it's way too late. So the elderly perpetrators that are in the news now are being brought to court. It's sufficient to show they worked at a particular place of death. That's all you need to show, not that they had the subjective intention, the motivation to murder. So now, if we'd had this interpretation of law, then we could have brought far more Nazi perpetrators to trial. But that is a new turn in legal practice since 2011. Uh, the GDR I find very interesting. Former Nazis in the GDR were six or seven times more likely to be sentenced for Nazi crimes. Six or seven times more likely. More severe sentences, 129 death sentences. Oh, sorry about my spelling on the 3,191 <laughs> um, sentenced more than 10 years. Um, Life meant life. Now, remember Rudy Zimmermann, my ethnic German in Poland, and his boss, Walter Tormeyer. Rudy Zimmermann went to East Germany, and he was sentenced to life imprisonment for being a lowly chap who killed maybe somewhere between 90 and 110 people, shooting them, on the orders of his boss, Walter Tormeyer. What does Walter Tormeyer do? He goes to West Germany. And he gets an incredibly lenient sentence, and the judge, in the summing up of Tormeyer's trial, this is where I nearly passed out when I was reading it, I thought, I cannot believe this judge saying this. He said, Tormeyer showed evidence of humanity, because when he was about to murder his Jewish mistress, remember the walk in the woods, shooting in the back of the neck, he showed a humanity in not warning her in advance that he was about to shoot her. Can you imagine that? The judge actually said this in his summing up, and this mitigated the offence, and so his sentence could be a little less severe. Um, lots of other things I could say about East Germany, but I won't. This another, it is another one that I quite like. It's one of the cases I looked at. You'll know the photo on the left. Everyone sees that photo again and again. We look at the little boy with his hands up. In fact, if you look just to his right in the background, there is a guy standing with a gun. Um, just behind the little boy. That is Josef Blücher, who was brought to court in East Germany in 1969. That's him in the dock on the right-hand side. And Josef Blücher was sentenced to death and put to death for his actions in the suppression of the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising. And the guy who was giving Josef Blücher the orders, surprise, surprise, they took years and years and years in West Germany, kept saying there wasn't enough evidence and we can't get testimony from Poland because it's, you know, Cold War and we don't really recognise states that recognise the GDR and all that kind of stuff. So uh, it's another nice example of this. Um, finally, the era of the survivor. I think we've talked a lot, the literature has talked a lot about what's called the era of the witness in the 60s and 70s. I think that is an era in which survivors are asked to talk about the deeds of others and not about what they themselves experienced and what it did to their lives. From the later 70s though, you get a quite different culture and context. Um, great evaluation of victimhood, PTSD is recognised post-Vietnam War. Uh, lots of creative representations, I've just mentioned the, the obvious ones, the TV miniseries with Meryl Streep, Holocaust. Do not learn your history from that TV <laughs> miniseries. There are so many inaccuracies, it's excruciating to watch, but never mind. Um, it really came into German living rooms and they thought, oh, these were quite nice people, they were one of us, and yet they were Jewish and we did nasty things. So it makes a big difference, Spielberg and so on. But I think at the same time as that growing interest in the survivor, you have continued resistance to recognise what you did, and particularly continued resistance among big industrialists to pay compensation to the former slave and forced labourers 
that they'd employed and whose lives they'd ruined. They were only really recognised from the year 2000 um, for various reasons I won't go into, but way too little too late. So growing memorialisation, including those who'd been previously ignored, the gypsies, Roma and Zinti, gay men finally start getting recognised from the 1980s onwards, victims of euthanasia similarly, but the perpetrators remain out of sight still and refuse to acknowledge responsibility. And when you start looking at the private stories, the reckonings in the private sphere, there's this continuing injustice. Victims and survivors are agonised by what they've been through and feel agonised about survivor guilt, that they didn't have sufficient agency, they saved themselves at the expense of others, or they didn't manage to save their baby brother, their baby sister, their mother who went to the gas chambers. They agonise about the fact that getting off the train, they said, yeah, you go that way, you'll be well looked after, I can work and help look after you, and then they discover that way make the gas, you know, those kind of things. Um, and they have, for decades after the war, great difficulty in finding anyone who'll listen to the story. Our interest in Holocaust survivor stories is very recent. It's really only the last 20, 30 years. The post-war years, they couldn't find publishers for memoirs, Anna Frank is an, an exception for particular reasons, and people didn't want to hear about it. You know, you be in America and the Americans would say, yeah, we suffered too during the war, it wasn't a great time for anyone. You know, total failure to communicate. Perpetrators, quite the opposite way around, only obeying orders, couldn't have done anything different. Um, the sense that they were not themselves guilty or responsible, that they were just do performing, but inside they didn't really feel comfortable with it, so they're not really guilty. And impact on the second generation, this is Rudy Zimmermann again, my ethnic German Pole, as a good family man, a nice father, in those family snapshots from the family al album. I went to interview his son in 2016, and I thought, get my professional hat on, prepare my interview questions, you know, go in, how was it like growing up in the GDR as the son of a Nazi, because he lived in the GDR. I get in there, he knew nothing about what his father had done. He remembered the Stasi coming in, raiding the house, taking his father away. He remembered the trial and his mother being away during <coughs> the trial and so on. Um, but he was told by his mother that his father, who was sentenced to life imprisonment, was a victim of GDR injustice, Stasi injustice, not that his father was a Nazi murderer. So instead of doing my interview, I came as the bearer of very bad tidings to tell him you may have thought your father was an innocent man, wrongly put on trial, but actually he had definitely shot and killed X number of people. So, interesting, um, not knowing can actually protect the second generation. And I think what you find in a lot of families of children of perpetrators, they kind of want to know, but they also don't want to know. They really don't want to face up. They want to love their father, their grandfather, um, they've got a strong emotional tie and they don't really want to know whether they did something awful. I found that particularly in a previous book of mine, A Small Town Near Auschwitz, where the son of the guy I was writing about was really resistant to understanding how deeply implicated his father had been. And it's very difficult for us today, particularly as a historian, but also as someone who's personally involved, to, to know how to deal with that. It's actually emotionally quite difficult. Um, children of survivors, there's been a lot of research on, but very often they have the feeling, as one person put it at the beginning of her account, she said, everything that was really important in my life happened before I was born. You know, that's what they grow up with, the feeling that the past was more important than they are, that they don't really know what pain and suffering, hunger, etc. means, and they have to live with parenting their parents, and lots of interesting things about children of survivors, but I think the children of perpetrators angle has not been as yet as well understood, and is equally complex. <coughs> But enormous variations, this is one of the things I wanted to get at, it's not just a question for social psychologists, it's also a question of where you grow up. It's enormously different if you grow up in anti-Semitic post-war Poland than if you grow up in Brooklyn, New York, or Israel, or North London. These differences make an enormous difference to, the, the context makes an enormous difference to the significance for the second generation. Memorialisation and oblivion, I've just chosen three um, photos here quickly to intimate to you. 
Ravensbrück in the GDR, heroic statues of solidarity and so on. Nollendorfplatz, that was the first, um, that's a, an U-Bahn station in Berlin, was the first memorial to homosexual victims of Nazism put up in 1988 against enormous opposition, oddly. The Berlin Traffic Authority, the BVG, didn't want it on one of its U-Bahn stations. They finally allowed it, and it's now like that. Um, the one on the right is, I think, absolutely typical for Austria. Mauthausen, enormous concentration camp, but there are a huge network of subcamps employing slave labour all the way down the Danube. And you may think the Danube is a nice place to do a cycling holiday from Linz to Vienna, and most people do that. If you're my husband, you discover that you've been lured under false pretenses <laughs> into going from one concentration camp to the next, later sub camp to the next. We couldn't find this milk one. I knew it existed. And we went into a local Gusthof and had a beer and got chatting to the waitress of a certain age who I was sure would tell me, she said, oh, no, nothing like this around here. And then a younger person, a waiter who was maybe in his 20s, said, yes, there used to be a place, but they they um, put sand against it, they obscured the entrance, they've built over it, there's a housing estate, there's nothing you can see. So I say, where is it that there is nothing to see? Where would we have to go if we wanted to see where there is no longer anything to see? And he started explaining, I said, okay, straight up, and turn right, turn left, and so on. We got there. It, there was indeed a housing estate, but there was one very brambly, unbuilt over thing saying private, no entrance, do not go in, so we trotted in. <laughs> and found that little hole in the side of the hill, which was the entrance to a tunnel in which hundreds of slave labourers had died, who had worked for industry, industries that went on making profits after the war, didn't want to acknowledge their disgraceful past, and there is no memorial. Um, another of my sons always says, wherever we go, look, mummy, there is no memorial, because that's kind of a refrain I have. But there is a problem with Europe. If there are so many sites of death and mass graves and suffering, what do you do? You cannot memorialise everywhere. So is it perhaps a good thing that we concentrate all the memory in Auschwitz, just one place, and let people get on with their lives in other places? Uh, this is Mia Let's back to the Zimmermann. On the right is the site where the synagogue was burned down and people burned alive. They've just put a stone there long ago when we visited it had a swastika painted on it. On the left is the German cemetery from the former German colony where Zimmermann and his family and other ethnic Germans lived, where Americans who came from their descendants of the German colony people put a huge amount of effort into memorialising the former German colony. It's a total disparity. Um, so I think with memorialisation there's a serious problem. We shouldn't just, we should of course celebrate survivors, listen to their stories, but it's not sufficient. There's a lot more we need to know. And I think with Never Again we can't just focus on historical ideologies. So I think what my work really does is to raise some much wider questions, um, and I've just pulled out a few of them here. The problem of how do you achieve justice after such massive collective violence? You know, is it a good idea to not punish former Nazis, to rehabilitate and reintegrate them? I don't think so, but we can debate that. Um, what are the implications of different strategies of selectively silencing the past? I'm quite glad that Rudy Zimmerman's son grew up not knowing what his father had done. It may, he may have had a much easier childhood and adolescence and then as a middle-aged man was able to cope with actually thinking about it. I think it's unfair on young West Germans that they grew up feeling this enormous burden of collective shame and felt guilty to be German, even though they were not technically guilty themselves, whereas younger East Germans didn't grow up with that. East Germans in 1989 were able to say, we are the people, wir sind das Volk, and use the word folk unproblematically in a way that West Germans couldn't possibly have done. And we are one people, this entire folk in 1989. That was only possible in East Germany because they'd grown up without that shame. They had been able not to feel bad about being proud to be German, if you follow that. Um, questions around ways of ensuring that people don't stand passively by. Um, don't effectively condone collective violence by feeling they can't stand up and, and act against it. 
And I think finally, rather than just um, dealing with anti-Semitism as an ideology, we have to look at the institutional, social and political conditions which ensure that any <coughs> violence can be adequately dealt with and minorities can be protected. It's not just a question of going into schools and saying you should not be anti-Semitic. There's far more to it than that. But what there is, it, you know, we are all debating at the moment because unfortunately these issues have not gone away. They just have reappeared in different circumstances and different forms. So thank you very much for your attention.